speaking about patterns that repeat, speaking about morphic resonances that appear throughout history in different forms, the kind of egregores, if you will, Matt. I was listening to The Rest is History, a very popular history podcast that you also like, and they were talking about Martin Luther. I think they have a four or five part series um, mm. on yeah. Martin Luther, the monk Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, the the person who kicked off the Reformation and Lutheranism. He spawned, he spawned a, a whole race of enemies of your people, the Protestants. <laughs> um, right, yeah, the evil heretic <laughs> Martin Martin Luther, who tore asunder the um, the one true church in Catholicism. So they they make some observations which I thought were interesting and speak to themes that we cover here. So listen to them talking a little bit about this Luther chap. This is after he's already you know caused up a bit of controversy. And for those who don't know, just a very brief primer. Martin Luther, uh, 16th century monk, mm -hmm. 15th century, where was he? Yeah, 16th century, I think. Let's see, got it right, one try. 16th century German monk who took issue with the Catholic Church over no. various things. God damn it. Well, we are both right. <laughs> 15th and 16th century, I just checked. Born in 1483, died 1546. <laughs> yep. That's fine, we were right. We, were, we, we got <laughs> the range. So... Medieval monk Martin Luther King, who uh, no, no, <laughs> not <Martin> King. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you don't come to us for history, right? <laughs> Martin Luther, who Martin Luther King took his name from? Okay, he was a, a monk, Catholic monk, Benedictine, I think. Or anyway, these details don't matter. He was a monk. He took issue with what the Catholic Church were up to in Germany. He kind of protested about this thing called indulgences, about getting out of purgatory and all their abuses. And he ended up creating a reformation which led to the formation of a whole bunch of Protestant churches which remain to this day. The fact that we Thank have you. Protestant and Catholic churches in significant portion is traced to Luther's activity, right? Um, so yeah. when he was doing this, controversial figure at the time, you can imagine, causing some trouble. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he started off as a monk, but he kind of was invited to leave because he wasn't really fitting in so well there and he sort of became more of an academic religious scholar a professor of theology um mm -hmm. and i think it was in that in that position that he did his most Plus inflammatory trouble. stuff so i think this is relevant to some of the parallels that we might be might, might be drawing true mm -hmm. so this is them talking about a portion of that story there's there's tons of stuff but um uh, listen to some of the details here. He gets summoned to a chapter meeting of the Augustinians. He's an Augustinian monk in April 1518. And it's held in Heidelberg. And it's quite a long way. Again, we see his mastery of publicity. He walks there. So, you know, that that's really drawing attention to himself. And he's treated as an absolute celebrity everywhere he goes. He's kind of cheered and he gets to Heidelberg and the, the local prince shows off, um, you know, his chapel and his castle and invites Luther to dine with him. So it's all tremendous. So, Tom, is there a slight Jordan Peterson side to all Yes, this? a little bit, I think. A celebrity yeah. professor who has yeah. said the unsayable. And who has yeah. gotten it suddenly, you know, do you remember how people were first reported yeah. when Jordan Peterson was doing rallies and stuff? People would say, it's amazing that somebody who's basically talking about, what is it, some sort of lobsters? Jungian philosophy. Yeah, Jungian philosophy yeah. is inspiring young people. You know, what a remarkable thing. And it's the same. Exactly. If you think of the kind of, that he is saying things that have, in universities for a long time, have been unsayable. Luther is doing something similar at Heidelberg. So he is now directly attacking the foundations of the theology that has prevailed in the Latin West for centuries and centuries. I like this comparison with Jordan Peterson. I'm sure you'll play some other things which elaborate yeah. on it a bit. The only thing I don't like about it, I think you and also the co-hosts of the rest of history would agree, it might appear to be giving Jordan Peterson a little bit too much credit to be <laughs> comparing him to... Uh, world influencing figure like Martin Luther um, but you know so, so just put that aside if if that if well, that he would be very you. happy about the comparison well, Jordan <laughs> Jordan would be happy yeah yeah but <laughs> yeah, Martin Luther uh, but, probably not <laughs> but also they present it as him saying the unsayable and ta attacking the pillars of the university and they kind of draw a parallel with like Jordan Peterson attacking the 
arts and humanities and post-colonial studies and that kind of thing. But I don't really think that's what Jordan Peterson's primary appeal was. It like it, he didn't reform, you know, Martin Luther led to the emergence of completely new forms of religion, right, mm. uh, within the, a kind of Christian framework. Jordan Peterson doesn't, <laughs> doesn't do that. And he, he also isn't an expert in most of the subjects of the attack. So I think the parallel about that, about him, you know, taking down the dogma of the day in like a super well-informed way is a little bit off. But in terms yeah. of him being a figure emerging from an academic context and courting controversy with an eye for spectacle and yes. polemics, yeah. that is absolutely a parallel. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There are, there are some points of where the analogy or comparison fits points where it doesn't. But in going through the psychology, I guess, of Martin Luther, and there are lots of little hints in his early career as to the kinds of things that was driving him. I mean, it did feel to me, even before they mentioned the comparison, it, it felt like similarities in that people like Martin Luther and Jordan Peterson, Martin Luther very much felt that he was special <laughs> right from the very beginning. And he was very critical and, you know, coming up with different interpretations of theological texts and so on and yeah. courting controversy and, and looking for a stage on which to strut and, you know, not taking anything away from him. But his, his, motiv his motivations were quite strong in terms of being personal ones. And I think you could even see a fair bit of narcissism uh, in yeah. there. And at the same time, he seemed to be somewhat malleable somewhat labile in terms of the specific things that he would make his mission like it, it changed over his career yeah it's hard to articulate exactly but i think there are certain figures that are kind of true believers or are on a particular cause and they're set in stone and there are people for whom their career is kind of more about them and their personal arc so it, the thing is that luther's persona as widely understood is often tied up with his objection to indulgences like i introduced at the start right but listening to this series about it it's clear that a lot of it is more tied up to his kind of certitude about his interpretations of things so his criticism of indulgences is important to him but it's really only a symptom of the fact that he has developed a brand new way to understand his relationship with god and how everyone else's <laughs> You're exactly right, Chris. That's You've said it better than I could. This is not to say that his criticisms of indulgences or other aspects of the Catholic Church weren't substantive and important ones in and of themselves. But when you look back at his pattern of behavior throughout his career, he was a person that was looking for trouble with a very, a very strong certitude in his own particular interpretations of things. And he was going to cause trouble for whatever organization he found himself in and he was definitely drawn to the crowds and to the pulpit like the popular pulpit and not content merely to be part of a system whether whether an academic one or the catholic church where he he played his role so yeah um it's a really interesting character and um, i'm really enjoying this uh, particular series by the way we should also mention that you and i have started reading the book by Dominion. one of the co-hosts Dominion. I mean, we're not loving it so far, but it's an interesting. If you want to trek. play along, please, you can read the book, or if you have it, just like leap through it and reflect because we'll we'll discuss it in a while when we finish it. But yeah, I have got some feedback from various people that have listened to it or read it previously, and their thinking is similar to us. But so we're not endorsing all the books we've read, but on the back of this these series of episodes that is partly what inspired us to to go read it so tom holland's book and it's very influential amongst various gurus because it's essentially putting a very large amount of credit for the modern west to christianity in in its ancient and reformation form so that gels with the religious yeah. predilections of the heterodox and guru sphere. Yeah, I can see how people can take history books and and see it as supporting a particular kind of ideological slant or whatever. But for, for me, the main attraction in in history, whether it's a podcast or a book, is just the story. You know, it's just the details are always so interesting. There, there was a, a bit that I loved about Martin Luther's life is that his his great sponsor, yeah, the Elector of Wittenberg, Wittenberg, whatever, you know, had to hide him from the church 
people that were gonna were gonna kill him. So he 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 would stay at the castle, and they dressed him as a knight. And so he had he had yeah. to get a, a knight's haircut, had to wear a sword, you know, wear knightish clothes. But he wasn't a very convincing knight. Like they took him hunting. And he wept, I think, when they killed the rabbit. <laughs> and so he was. I just, I just found it funny. This guy that was was so much of a, a force, an intellectual force in medieval Europe, was was really quite a, a soft theater kid. And, and I, was, yeah, was, I can kind of imagine Jordan Peterson crying over the body of a dead <laughs> rabbit on the hunt as well. So the parallel might strike farther than that. And speaking of parallels, they did also reference another figure from the modern discourse. But the third aspect of of what is making this a crisis is that Luther is an absolute master of self-promotion. And, you know, this is really unexpected. I mean, he's he's a professor in an obscure university, but he just kind of lights the touch paper. And his master, particularly of printing, which we talked about in the previous episode. I mean, printing has been around for about a century. He turns out to, to be absolutely so suited to a kind of social media revolution. So um, Alec Ryrie, the great history, historian of Protestantism, I mean, he, put, he says he turns out to have a kind of raw Trumpian brilliance at German language polemic. And I think that people have been buying printed matter, but Luther makes it exciting. And so they get into the habit of buying it and perhaps kind of reading it out to people who can't read and so on. And so it's Luther really who generates the market for buying printed matter in a way that no one had done previously. And you know your Trumpian analogy. Is that Luther, there's a kind of populist side to Luther's rhetoric, isn't there? He's brilliant at uh, describing things in very aggressive, scatological, sometimes funny, raw kind of earthy terms in a way that maybe virtually no other theologians can do so he can reach people who other people can't reach absolutely and the other thing that he does is that he's very very good at staging a public event parallels are hard not to notice yeah. <laughs> arguably a bit of a cross between a trump and a, a jordan peterson i think there's the some truth in that I, I, to, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a great it's not a great thought is it but I think there's some truth to that too about the importance of technology and the the information ecology in in providing fertile grounds for these kinds of things to happen. Like Jordan Peterson could not have become a public figure without access to YouTube. And I think a bit like Luther sort of innovated the idea of like a, a theologian and an academic and a churchman actually writing stuff that was fun for the common people to read and actually using the printing press to its full extent. I mean, in, in the same way, when YouTube was new, it was novel, I think, for the world that an academic, a distinguished professor, a psychologist, a very erudite and very well-informed guy is leaving the ivory tower and actually broadcasting his lectures on YouTube to make them available to everyone who wants to hear them. And just like with Martin Luther, doing it in that polemical, rhetorical, using all of those flourishes that makes it very appealing. So, you know, we don't want to overstate the analogies, but I, you know, I think it's there's an interesting comparison there. And especially... The fact that like people find that kind of approach, you know, the earthy, scatological, ag- aggressive rhetoric, that's more appealing, right? So they're they're kind of getting into it and they're describing Luther as being something of a master of that. And they, they contrast it in another case, right? And uh, this is them describing like Luther versus a guy, Eck. Although Eck is very good, at debating. And although he does understand the importance of self-publicity, you know, he's nowhere compared to Luther. And basically, I mean, X reputation gets annihilated by Luther and by his followers. So he gets satirized as a a, a lecher, as a drunkard. Satires on him are published that show him flying on a goat that then gets showered in shit. He's shown as employing a witch. Uh, he ends up being castrated. One story, he, get, he ends up being castrated, exactly. <laughs> come on, someone, you just come they, they issue um, <laughs> cartoons showing him as a pig, and he just becomes a kind of public object of ritual in the way that someone being monstered on social media might be today. And Eck is really the, the, he's the first victim of modern social media, you might say. Right. And Lyndall Roper says of, of his victory that it ultimately doesn't matter because it was not interesting. Whereas Luther's campaign was interesting and caught people's attention. Yeah, the attention economy, right? And the other aspect of it too, which I hadn't noticed till just then, Chris, is, you know, you've emphasised with our grievance mongering thing, the the part of it, which is the personal feuds and, yeah. and having those enemies and 
beating them down in the court of public opinion is, is something. <laughs> I mean, just to clarify, like we wanted to play this not to make the point that, hey, Martin Luther and Jordan Pearson, t- totally exactly the same person, no differences no. at all. The point is rather that I, th- I think for us, secular gurus are interesting because it is a, a universal phenomena to some degree and, and takes different forms at different places and times. And if it was a phenomenon that just existed in the last 10 years, then that wouldn't be very interesting. But if, if we think we can see it happening further back in different places and times, then it becomes more interesting to us. I think the way I would phrase it is that the guru phenomenon is what you describe. The secular guru part is probably... More recent, though, I suspect you can find versions of it in societies that have emphasized, uh, you know, secular kind of things. When I said secular guru there, Chris, I actually thought about it. You know, he's obviously a church guy, right? But this is a religion that is a very intellectual religion, right? Like he's he's an academic and, and the arguments that they have, the debates that they have are very much academic arguments about religion. So it's not an important point, I suppose. But I don't know that there's necessarily a great big fat dividing line necessarily between religion and and secular because a lot of this religion is not just kind of revealed truth, even though Martin Luther does emphasize the importance of kind of that sort of personal revelation. But the the, the arguments and the appeals and the debates are all happening in the intellectual sphere. I would still say it matters at the fundamental level. Martin Luther is making a fundamentalist argument about the interpret original interpretation of the text and the reason it matters is because it's about your soul and where it will spend eternity so like that's part of what gives it the oomph right like if it was a missive against the king and he was making arguments about the authority of kings and you know how that's been misinterpreted over the years or whatever i feel like it wouldn't achieve the same kind of status. So it needs the appeals to religion and revealed truths and these kind of things. So that's why I think there is a difference with like the secular instantiation of it because it's making appeals in a similar way, but I I think it matters that they cannot make reference to divine sources of authority and revealed troops yeah i don't know i mean i think even though the the topic is different and the grounds for evidence is different right like for them grounds for evidence is in where are your citations in the scriptures whereas on a scientific topic the grounds for evidence would be different but apart from that the argumentation and the the differences of opinion are like a, a philosophical and and theoretical ones in other words intellectual ones um but anyway i mean it's you know i mean there obviously is a difference <laughs> One topic is about religion, uh, other topics are referring to science and so on. But when it comes to understanding, like thinking them as gurus, I don't. it may not matter very much. No, I think the, the guru dynamics are consistent. It's just some of the aspects that come along when you're dealing with religion and, and supernatural powers and eternal souls. Here's my point in a nutshell. Someone like a medieval academic like Martin Luther is not going off into the top of the mountain and coming down and saying, I had God directly speak to me. And he's told me, you know, this, right? He, he's not the guy. He was the guy in the United States who had the, Moses. was pulling out the, no, the guy, he had a hat. He was pulling, he could he'd look inside the hat and. Oh yeah. The Mormon? guy that founded the Mormons. Okay. The guy that founded the Mormons. Like that's revealed truth. Right. But someone like, Martin Luther, or indeed the, the the Catholic priests he was arguing with, they are making re- recourse to theoretical and philosophical arguments based on their interpretation of scripture. So it's all Yeah, different. but they do have their moments of flashes of insight, right? Like the, you know, part of the story of Luther is these dramatic moments where he'll make a pledge to God uh, to do something if something happens and whatnot. So like, it's not all intellectualized, but I do agree that it, a lot of it takes the format of that. But also, you know, you wouldn't accuse Trump of being an intellectual titan, right? And they are there drawing parallels to the way he argues where it's not really about the strength of the argument. It's more about just making fun and, and showing someone as like a, 
a horse yeah. shitting itself or something like that. <laughs> yeah, true, true. But anyway, I, fascinating story. Do you have any more clips about Luther from these guys? Last one. And this one reminded me of, <laughs> I, they don't make the parallel, but I mean, they do sort of, but this made me think of Jordan Peterson and his posting habits on Twitter. Well, it is thrilling because again, you know, he's now going full tilt and week after week, he's coming out with ever more brilliant kind of heresies, shocking, thrilling heresies. And he can do this basically because now he's no longer a monk. He's not bound to the monastic routine. So he can just spend his whole time, you know, on the equivalent of a computer, yeah. firing out kind of messages and things. Yeah. And actually, like someone waking up, going on Twitter, abusing people, replying to abuse, he spends a lot of his time replying to people who are sending him <laughs> abuse. And so he's very kind of Trumpy and he invents nicknames for his enemies. So Eck is that fool, the Pope, that wolf. But he's also writing a series of brilliant treatises. And I think he's feeling, you know, I might as well hang for a sheep as a lamb. I'm going full in. And so by this point, he's thinking that it's not enough just to reform the church, but it's got to, the whole thing has just got to be pulled down. And he starts to broadcast this message and he is dominating the discourse in a way that no one had ever done before. Look, the parallels are just too fun. So I'm going to, I'm going to lead into them regardless of um, <laughs> yeah. anything else. I it's, it's just, that there might be, but it's, yeah. I, I think there's, there's definitely there's I something mean, there. The, I mean, it, it's yeah. just fun to imagine Martin Luther crouched over a keyboard firing off angry tweets. You, yeah, that, you son that, of a horse of ass covered in excrement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think he would be. And I, I think like, I don't think Jordan Peterson is going to have the lasting impact that Martin Luther had no, on no. You know, world civilization. That's, that's part of the difference, but it is the kind of character that Jordan Peterson is, is the same kind of character that Martin Luther is. That might be sacrilegious to Lutherans, but I, I get the impression <laughs> from the description that it is somebody who has very thin skin, sees themselves as a prophet, right? With the insight mm. that all the other yep. fools lack and thinks that they should dominate the discourse. That's right. They yep. should be yep. responsible And, and, and is incredibly loquacious and I incredibly good at, at, you know, holding court and speaking so confidently to the population and railing against authorities with a bespoke kind of interpretation of things. Just as having those grievances and the, and the, the personal enmities and litigating them out. Um, and just like, you can tell he just like loves it. Like that's, that's what he was born to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's just good fun. Just fun stuff. Like. The important message for me is not like, you know, perfectly understandable of all the people who are more familiar with this era or whatever say, well, actually, you know, I think these parallels are overdrawn or whatever. But but yeah. I think one thing that is important to think about is that often when people are talking about the way that people are behaving now with social media and whatnot, they're talking as if in previous eras, people were much more serious. They were they wouldn't be <laughs> doing this kind of foolish. A figure like Martin Luther wouldn't stoop to the level of a Jordan Peterson mm. in the right book. But when you actually look at history, people are always like this. Yes, there are more serious figures and less serious figures, but like you mm. you have to appreciate that people were always people. And yeah. you know, and, and I think gurus were always gurus. So yeah. 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 With apologies to Lutherans for <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but you know I mean like we hinted out, I mean there is there is a big difference and that Jordan Peterson almost certainly will not change the world in the way that Martin Luther did. And you know, whatever his personal qualities and his personal motivations were at the time, there were absolutely a lot of extremely good arguments to be made against the way the Catholic Church did business. And he was speaking to, uh, you know, a hell of a lot of truths about, you know, indulgences and purgatory and the, the, the way that the priests mediated between people and their God. I mean, regardless of what he was as a human being, I think he totally was a guru in the same, in the same mold as Jordan Peterson. I, I think he was perhaps the right man in the right place. That was a time where where someone had to be like that, where maybe someone like Jordan Peterson, he was born in the wrong time in the wrong place. <laughs> One interesting component to me is, and I think Tom Holland, by the way, the historian, takes the opposite opinion that you suggested there, where he thinks it is very much the individual character of Luther that generates this situation. Uh, um, uh, he leans more towards that. But the thing which I find quite convincing and it's it's a broader point not entirely related just to martin 
Luther that Holland makes about the Reformation and the effects of it and the the fact that religion in the West, in Europe, becomes, in part because of the Reformation, but also because of the response to the Reformation, one which is focused on personal belief. That can be, you know, Catholic personal belief or Protestant personal belief, but belief matters. What do you think matters, right? And the contrast is that previously, your personal feelings about which God was real or, you know, the theological concerns was not really the business of normal folk, right? Yeah. Because it was kind of above their pay grade, but also it didn't really matter. Like, oh, you don't personally believe in God, doesn't matter. You are you have things that you're supposed to do depending on where you live. And the contrast is, and I think this is right, that there are lots of places in the world where that mode of religiosity is more dominant, where belief is not the central thing. And it's it's this distinction in religious studies or elsewhere called orthopraxic versus orthodoxic religion, like religions focused on practice versus those that are focused on beliefs. And when you take somebody who has grown up in a orthodoxic context, like a you know, Christian or Islamic context, their thing is that it matters which gods you believe. And if you're going to temples or shrines or whatnot, you are expressing belief in a religious system mm. or whatnot. But it, in places where orthopraxy is common, that typically doesn't happen. So Japan is a, a good example of this, but going to shrines and temples does not indicate for most people like strong belief in a particular deity or a particular religious system. But it still can be important to perform the correct rituals. And I, I just thought it is interesting because he makes the case that, you know, modern atheism of the kind of new atheism, Dawkins type, is an outgrowth of this kind of shift in religiosity to think that what people believe matters, right? And that includes the denigration of belief that you don't personally believe. Hmm. I know that various atheists have kind of rankled at that, but I actually think that it's true because in orthopraxic yeah. society, atheism is not a, such a big issue because nobody really cares if you, <laughs> if you believe or not. Like, they don't care that much if you do the rituals, but, you know, even in contexts where they do, yeah, as long as you go and do the... So the important thing is you do the ritual. Yeah, I mean, in the Dominion book, when he's talking about some of the times the before the Romans converted to Christianity, they were persecuting the Christians. Often it was because, say, a city had suffered some you know, some disasters, famine, plague, stuff like that. So, uh-oh, the gods are unhappy with us, Apollo or whoever. Everybody needs to go and make a make a sacrifice, make a little offering. If everyone does that, hopefully it'll fix things. So they wanted the Christians to do it too. They didn't care what the Christians believed. They just needed to go and make the bloody sacrifice, right? Because that would hopefully put an end to these things. And the Christians wouldn't, so that they got persecuted. One of the things that these guys say is they say people from a European background or Western atheists are atheists in a very Protestant way. I have to admit the truth of that, which is that it is about personal belief for the Protestants. And it, it is kind of a small step to go from, you know, having that struggle with your conscience, having that personal revelation, and then coming down on the side of faith to maybe having that going through that process and coming down on the other side of it. And if you're a, if you're an atheist and you think it kind of matters whether or not you believe in a God or not, then I'm sorry, but they're kind of right. <laughs> you, you are yeah, a bit of a... There, I think there is arguments, and we'll talk about it more with the book because I think Dominion is going to make that case as well in the later sections. But yeah, I agree. That is not to say that there isn't... Like, I don't buy the argument where people then will go from there to say, well, atheism is just another religion, right? Because... You just have an opinion in God like all the other monotheistic religions. And I think that's a little bit of sophistry, right? Because th there is a difference between saying yeah. that, that you don't believe in any God and believing in particular gods. Yeah. But they are correct that the fact that you think belief matters and there's an important thing that you need to talk about does speak to some specific foundational assumptions. And, I, you know, I think these are foundational assumptions that are not that unreasonable to hold. Mm. 
but mm. I, they are not assumptions which apply in every place and every culture and every time. So that's yeah. the point to make. Yeah, we'll we'll relegate this discussion till after we've finished the book. But you know, I'm enjoying it. I'm not sure if I'm not quite sure what the penultimate thesis is that uh, he's working towards. If indeed he is, so far it's kind of just a narrative story. I think I've got it. I mean, if the thesis is is that yeah, Christianity and the evolution of it has been you know an instrumental guiding force in Western culture, then I would half go along with it. I think at this point, which is that. I, could so, I see that obviously it's intermingled with the rest of cultural evolution, but I'm not always sure that like half the time it could be reflecting a mood, reflecting a zeitgeist as much as driving it. I mean, they said that when, when Christianity took over the Roman Empire, it changed. Rome took over Christianity as much as Christianity took over Rome. It came, Christianity became much more hierarchical, much more respectful of authority, all of these things. So, you know, I, I see it as, as just more of a... Cross-pollination. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's part of the mix rather than saying, oh, pointing to this one thing is this is the causal factor. Yeah, I, I, I think anybody arguing that like Christianity didn't play a significant role in, in Europe and the West, it, like obviously they're wrong because it's a huge... It's, it would be like saying Buddhism didn't play a role in East Asia, right, societies or Confucianism. Like obviously it did. But the extent to which you explain everything in the society based on religious systems is, I think, debatable, highly debatable is the way I would put it. So that will be the bit that I take issue with is like how strongly you want to make a specific causal attribution, right? Solely to Christianity. That's always the problem with historical analysis. Like I think, I think it's always dangerous when you go from a particular contingent historical narrative in this particular timeline this is what happened and you're on firm ground and then once you take the next step and say this is the fundamental underlying reason why everything happened and you draw a big arc then then everything becomes extremely debatable 